I don't know if you've noticed, but this is a challenging time for state and local officials. We're having to rapidly embrace a 24-7 digital world in the midst of a pandemic. Luckily, iConstituent.com is on a mission to help digitize services with the first platform designed specifically for the elected official to manage one-to-one personal engagement. See for yourself how their texting outreach tools are making positive impacts during the pandemic, from the city of Los Angeles to the halls of the U.S. Congress. They allow leaders to leverage data sets of constituent phone numbers to share updates on COVID and assist constituents with breaking through the red tape to get the help they need. Visit iConstituent.com to access recent case studies and get started with 5,000 text messages at no cost. Again, that's iConstituent.com. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. I'm proud to say that we're closing in on both our second anniversary and our 50th episode. The New Deal and I are grateful to have shared some amazing leaders with you during that time. From Mayor Pete, when he was just a mayor, to rising stars in the Democratic Party like Senator Ramesh Akberry, Boise Mayor Lauren McLean, and Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. I believe that these leaders deserve a national stage. I hope you will help them, and me, by telling a friend about an honorable profession and rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And guess what? We're now on Instagram. Follow us at hashtag an honorable profession. Welcome to an honorable profession. I'm Debbie Cox Bolton, CEO of the New Deal, where we're proud to support so many of the leaders featured on this podcast. This is our 51st episode, and it's a fun one. I was able to turn the tables and interview our founding and regular host, Ryan Coonerty. Ryan's a New Deal leader himself, an outstanding elected official serving as county supervisor in Santa Cruz, California. Like most of our guests, he's on the front lines of the biggest challenges facing our country, from the pandemic to the recession and the fight for racial justice. Most recently, he's been responding to the wildfires that have devastated his district. We talked about his work, his journey into elected office, and why he's so passionate about public service. We also talked about our first 50 episodes, why he wanted to start this podcast, some of his favorite moments, and with the stakes so high in the upcoming election, how the inspiring and innovative leaders around the country he's interviewed give him hope for the future. Ryan Coonerty, welcome to an honorable profession. Thank you, Debbie. It's so fun to be here, and it's fun to be in this reverse role. It is. And I, of course, it's a, an extra special treat to get to interview you. Uh, as listeners know, you are the creator and longtime host of this podcast. And I just want to tell you what an amazing job you've done. Um, our first episode aired two years ago this month on September 11th, 2018, and featured a name that will be familiar to national political observers, former Missouri Secretary of State and U.S. Senate candidate Jason Kander. And now this episode that we're taping will be our 51st show. So I'm super excited to talk to you about your experience with this and what you've heard and learned uh, from New Deal leaders across the country in those two years. It's just been great over the past uh, 50 episodes. I think, you know, it's the leaders have turned out to be more extraordinary, more compelling than we even believe them to be in the first place. And we had pretty high expectations. And I just want to appreciate also you played in a tremendous role in the history of the New Deal, in being its heart and soul and having the vision and really supporting all these leaders and allowing them to serve this country in new and inventive ways and trying to solve the really tough challenges we face. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. It's my great honor, actually. Um, and, and, you know, the genesis of this podcast was to elevate the voices of those inspiring elected office holders. And you've done that uh, so well. Uh, they're serving so heroically um, across the country, particularly in these really extraordinary times. And, um, and also to remind people about the importance and the value of public service, which I think is so important right now. So, As our listeners know, in addition to being the host of this podcast, you are an elected official serving in your own right. And so I wanted to start with uh, with that a little bit. You're currently serving on the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors in Northern California. You served as the mayor 
and city council member of your hometown of Santa Cruz. And like elected officials across the country, you are leading in these extraordinary times with the pandemic, but you have a an extra extraordinary circumstance. You've been dealing with the devastating wildfires in California that have hit your district so particularly hard. So I just wanted to start by asking how you are doing, how's your family and your community um, through all of this? Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been a very challenging month. Uh, in addition to the challenges of the pandemic and the economic crisis that's followed, in addition to the many, many sort of crises by the day that we seem to be experiencing out of Washington, about a month ago, uh, we had the largest disaster in our county's history. Um, more than 80,000 acres burned, about 500 homes in my district burned. Uh, we had to evacuate uh, 70,000 people out of a total county population of about 280,000 people had to do it safely in the context of a pandemic. Um, it's been extraordinarily challenging. Um, you know, I think we're seeing the new reality of climate change, uh, and it's requiring us to, to really think about how we do business in totally different ways. And it's, uh, it's going to be a real challenge to, to recover and rebuild, uh, and to know that we have, you know, more natural disasters on the way, uh, in addition to whatever else the world throws at us. So, um, I haven't had a lot of sleep for a month, but, um, but I, but I've been proud of the way my community is pulled together to try to help each other in this difficult time. Yeah, I'm so glad. And you know that I live in California as well in a fire prone area and have um, my own experiences with evacuations. And it's just, it's just devastating. And I would love to hear maybe just a minute more on, um, you know, what what is it that your constituents need right now in terms of the short term recovery, um, as people are thinking about rebuilding? We just got containment of the fire a couple days ago. Uh, so there's still spot fires in the middle. Uh, we're still trying to restore power, uh, make sure the watersheds are safe. Um, from our, from our knowledge of what's happened, uh, in your community, uh, which is just down the coast from us, uh, after a fire and then the, you have your first rains, you're subject to mudslides that, um, can be deadly, uh, and almost immediate. And so, um, we're already thinking of, towards, not only we're just at the beginning of fire season, so there's still a lot of threat uh, to the parts of our community that haven't burned, but now we got to start thinking about uh, mudslides. And again, um, we still have about over a thousand people who are uh, staying in motels or shelters. Uh, we're trying to do that in a COVID safe way um, so that people who are already experiencing trauma aren't uh, exposed to this deadly pandemic. Um, so it's, it's been immensely challenging, but there really has been an outpouring of support from, um, not only people around the state giving to charities and helping families, uh, with their basic needs, but also frankly, from elected officials around the, the state and the, the country calling in to say, my community went through this. This is how you work with FEMA. This is how, these are the issues you're going to have. Um, this is what you can speed up. This is what you can't. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to be able to go through this and not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and also to know you're not alone in trying to navigate these very, very challenging times. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And we did have the devastating mudslides down here. So I, my heart is really just with you and, and your community at this time. Um, I know you'll get through it. And I'm glad to hear about that, that, that support. We saw that in Santa Barbara as well. Um, let me turn now to kind of your career in public service uh, and particularly your decision to run for office. Um, you grew up in Santa Cruz, as I mentioned. Your father, as I understand it, ran for city council after a devastating earthquake there when you were a teenager. So I, I first wanted to just ask, how did having a dad that served in an elect elected office shape your feelings about public service? Yeah, so um, it it most certainly did. I don't think at the time I had an appreciation for it, but clearly things were sinking in. Um, when I was about 15, uh, we had the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which obviously did huge damage across the Bay Area, the Bay Bridge, uh, but also the epicenter was about six miles outside of Santa Cruz. So uh, it destroyed about 70% of our downtown. Uh, many people lost their homes. My parents owned a 
the or, and still do own the bookstore uh, in the middle of town. And uh, it was d- severely damaged by the earthquake. We had to operate out of a tent for a couple years. Um, and so my dad, who always had an interest in politics, decided to run for city council uh, and eventually serve as mayor to help the rebuilding after that earthquake. Um, you know, I was 15 at the time. I was more interested in football and girls and music <laughs> and other things. But um, but I think what I saw was that the how human the process is. Um, by watching him sort of go through and try to ad- wrestle with the, what our community would look like as we rebuild, how do you rebuild honoring what's past, but building something for the future uh, and seeing that it was, you know, it's a very, it's normal people making decisions the best way they know how it sort of demystified the process a little bit so that it, you know, I think a lot of people, and hopefully this is one thing we do with the, this podcast is, uh, makes make it clear that serving an elective office is uh, a great honor and it's not it's never easy, um, but it also doesn't require some sort of pedigree or some sort of uh, advanced degrees. Uh, we have people who have came have come from every background um, to serve their communities. And when you see that it's that, Local leadership, especially, are regular people who live in a community and want to make it a better place. Uh, it it makes it accessible, and you also realize how much influence you can have simply by showing up and going to meetings and running for office. Yeah, I love that. I love that, and that's a great segue in the ne- my next question because I, I've been struck by um, a lot of the guests that you've interviewed on this show have talked about the decision they made to come back to their hometown and run for office and to try to make an impact where they lived. And that, I think, was your experience, too. After high school, you went to the University of Oregon, you know, on to the London School of Economics for a master's and then to the UVA for law school. Uh, I think you were working in Washington, D.C. on national security and election reform issues um, and then decided to come home. And um, I'm interested both about what brought you home and then uh, and then about your decision to run for your local city council. Yeah, so um, the story I tell is of uh, my what I call my Johnny Cash moment. Uh, after law school, I was working in national politics, and it was interesting. I was working for former presidents uh, on election reform. I was working on national security issues after 9-11. Um, one day, I was sitting in traffic on my way into D- D.C. I lived out in the Virginia suburbs. Uh, it was snowy and cold. I'm a California kid, so uh, that's not my natural environment. Um, and a Johnny Cash song came on the radio. And I thought at the time, it just sort of struck me that, you know, Johnny Cash w- really wouldn't want to hang out with me. Um, <laughs> and uh, that uh, I was leading a life where I was in a suit and tie every day and I was doing important work, but I was sort of inner transferable, I guess, with so many other sort of young staffers in Washington. And the moment I left, there'd be 10 men or women right behind me with same background doing the same work. Uh, And I thought, you know, I sort of wanted to have a more individual impact. I wanted to see the impact of my work more. Um, So I drove in and I gave notice and I packed up my car and drove out to California. I went down to Guatemala for a little while, decompress and work on my Spanish. But then when I came back to town, I watched a city council meeting and while they were all good people with the best of intentions, I think almost everyone on that council was over 65 years old and they just weren't speaking to the issues that me and my friends were worried about. Um, And I thought it'd be valuable to add a new voice to the city council and a new perspective. Um, And I ran and won. That's so fantastic. Was it really that that very day you heard that song that you did that? That's amazing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love that yeah. Story. And I mean, the funny part is, um, I mean, obviously he's passed now, but I don't know that Johnny Cash would want to hang out with me uh, after I moved back to Santa Cruz. <laughs> but it was just so clear to me that uh, that 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 he wouldn't want to hang out with me while I was a, a stuff suit in D.C. <laughs> I love that. Well, as a again a California transplant that lived in D.C., I get I get what you're saying with the weather too. So uh, I hear you. Um, I, t- I talked a little bit about the, in in that intro to that question about your your long list of degrees, um, and I haven't yet mentioned you're also the author of two books: uh, one uh, on inscriptions on monuments, the other on the changing nature of work. Um, and in April of this year, you were named 2020 2021 Fellow for the UC. 
National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement, where you're working on a project um, about what happened in Skokie 50 years ago when Nazis attempted to march through uh, that community at a time when it had the highest percentage of Holocaust survivors in the United States. Uh, so that is going to bring me to two questions. One, clearly education uh, and ongoing reading and writing seems to be a real thread throughout your life. Um, I'm curious about if, if, if that if that's true and, and, and how you think about the the linkage between um, lifelong learning and leadership. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about your uh, your project uh, with uh, about Skokie. Sure. So uh, so I it, it is a lifelong passion. I, I love reading and history and ideas. I teach at UC Santa Cruz and it allows me to stay engaged on those issues. Um, as a kid, I really wasn't that into books. My, as I mentioned, my parents owned a bookstore and I would often um, complain to them about why they couldn't own something useful like a pizza parlor or a sporting goods store, uh, why I was stuck with parents who owned bookstores. Um, but, you know, as, as often happens, and I'm sure will happen with our kids, uh, they may not appreciate uh, <laughs> what you're trying to teach them now, but but you hope over time. And um, you know, sort of midway through college, I got I I suddenly found books that were engaging and ideas that were engaging. I got involved in student government, um, and it's gone on from there. You know, I think one of the things that I've appreciated about New Deal is uh, when we go to conferences. Um, there's space not only for the day-to-day, you know, how do we build better sewer systems? How do we fix the education system? How do we respond to climate change? But there's also a real opportunity to think about what direction is our country headed in? What are the values that we hold? Um, are they changing? Are they not changing the influence of technology? And, you know, I think in all of us in any job, but especially in these jobs where you're trying to to run communities, it's really beneficial to, to also remind yourself of those big questions and struggle with them a little bit. Uh, and I find that, um, that the more I do that, the better I am on the day-to-day stuff and the more interesting life is. In terms of the project, yeah, it's, it's, this is something I was supposed to spend my summer working on. Unfortunately, pandemics and fires have uh, hijacked a lot of my time, but um, I teach classes in legal studies and Jewish studies uh, at UCSE. And um, the case I always like to come back to in my First Amendment classes or my Jewish studies classes uh, is this case of Skokie, where you had uh, a Nazi who wanted to march through the streets of Skokie, Illinois, uh, who at the time the community had the largest percentage of Holocaust survivors Uh, in the country uh, and essentially inflict psychological harm on people who had been traumatized by, you know, one of the world's greatest horrors. Uh, And, but the thing that I find interesting about it is um, that his lawyers uh, from the ACLU were by and large uh, Jews who had, who had either gone through the Holocaust themselves or had parents who'd gone through the Holocaust. And the, the lesson that they took away from the Holocaust was that you needed to protect civil liberties even when those civil liberties uh, are being pushed by people who you fundamentally disagreed with, that, that the rise of the Nazis was because civil liberties and free speech was not protected. Um, on the other side, you had uh, community members in Skokie and the city attorney of Skokie uh, who were Jews and Holocaust survivors. And their lesson of the Holocaust uh, was that you needed to confront and not allow dangerous speech like this. Um, and so you had two groups of people who had the same historical experience and they came to completely different um, conclusions. And then they had this legal conflict and a political conflict about whether uh, about whether Frank Collin was going to have uh, this right to march through their community. And I think, you know, in some ways, it's just a really interesting, hard, challenging case that's worthy of discussion. And it also, as we've seen in Charlottesville and so many other places, uh, created was sort of the first time we had this national discussion about how do you balance free speech and community rights Uh, where is the appropriate place to draw the line? Who gets to draw that line? So I'm hoping to sort of build a curriculum and a compelling story that, that allows people to, to read it and 
and reach their own conclusions. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think I think it's worth it's worth studying and talking about. Yeah, that's fascinating. Actually, it feels really relevant today <laughs> as as well. And it, it, it and I mentioned the uh, the book. I, I didn't know this actually till I and I've known you for a while about the the first book you wrote on this these inscriptions of the monuments. Um, there seems to be again a thread to me of if I understand correctly, you you know you you looked at some of the indelible words right that are that are. Um, memorialized uh, heroes and important events and, and other things in our history. And, um, and like this project you're doing uh, on Skokie, it, it, it feels like, and, and we are in one of those pivotal, you know, really crossroads moments for America um, that, that we need to kind of draw on our lessons of history and go back to our core values and grappling with these questions of, you know, when those values are in conflict. So, um, you know, is there anything you would want to talk about with that, with the inscriptions book and this kind of where we are in this moment of history that um, is, speaks to you right now, in addition to some of the, the other um, um, research projects you're, like this that you're doing, just what, what stands out to you as, as things we should be uh, thinking about historically of where we are right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so that book was born on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I'd go for runs around the National Mall uh, from memorial to memorial to the Capitol. Uh, and because I was from California, it was often too hot or too cold or just not fun to run. So I'd always take the excuse to stop at um, every memorial I could. And what I noticed in the Lincoln Memorial is... Um, People would walk up the steps and outside the memorial, it was chaos. It was like Disneyland on a summer weekend, families coming in and out, arguing, school buses full of people, uh, tour buses. But when you got inside, people stood there and they really engaged with the words, the Gettysburg Address, that are engraved on the wall. And it's not an easy read sort of to comprehend. It's not an easy read to physically uh, to physically read it. But um, but you saw people really stopping and thinking about these words because they were engraved in stone. Um, and so uh, once I sort of saw that, I started seeing these words engraved everywhere. It's sort of like when you're interested in buying a car, you start seeing that car uh, driving around town everywhere. Uh, and uh, I, so as I was traveling the country for these national commissions, I'd go for walks and I'd find these really amazing you know, either famous or totally unknown words engraved all over the country. And I thought there was a book there. So uh, eventually we put together a book with National Geographic. And I think, you know, the lesson that I learned, uh, I learned a couple lessons that are relevant today. One is, you know, words engraved in public places or statues, as we've seen, are an inherently political process. They are um, often not uh, done from the event. They're done for a current political moment. Um, and it's important to recognize that. That doesn't diminish the their importance, but just it's important to recognize. But the thing that I really learned was that while the words are important, what actually was the most important thing was that they were in public spaces where people had to engage with one another. And in a world where we're all retreating behind our computers and now in our houses because of the pandemic, uh, the role of public spaces where people are forced to interact is incredibly important. And whether it's the Lincoln Memorial uh, and the words there, or in uh, Yamhill Street in Portland, Oregon, they put a bunch of funny quotes in different positions all over the sidewalk. And the idea of the artist was just that he was going to force people to bump into each other and that when you had people bumping into each other and looking down at a quote, they would share a moment and build a connection that, that maybe they wouldn't otherwise, these two people wouldn't otherwise ever meet or have a, a, a reason to come in contact. And uh, so, you know, as we emerge from the pandemic, hopefully someday uh, the importance of our public spaces uh, and then once people are in those spaces, asking more of them than just sort of sitting in a park, but, but you know, talking about the, the questions before our country, the ideals of our country, uh, the failures of our country, um, I think is, is incredibly important. And I'm hopeful that, 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 that having been cooped up for so long, people will appreciate that more than ever. Yeah, I love that. And I, and I underscore you just said about uh, as we come out of this pandemic and this both historic and monumental opportunity, but also 
responsibility to um, to rebuild America and, and, and create a new normal um, is going to give us the opportunity to just think about a host of questions like this. And which leads me to, again, to the people who are you're, you've been talking to on this podcast and you yourself who are on the front lines as elected leaders who are going to be um, driving this really important change going forward. So um, so let's talk about the podcast a little bit. This was your idea, the show, um, An Honorable Profession. The title was your show. Um, it's our show, I, I like to say, because I have that tiny bit of credit you gave me for just of knowing a good idea when I hear it and jumping on board, but it's it's your show. Um, so I just kind of wanted to start with very basically, like, why, why did you want to do this and, and why the title An Honorable Profession? Sure. So uh, it was really basic in that... Um, Back when we all could travel, uh, you would bring New Deal leaders together regularly to get to know each other and to engage on big ideas and share you know, ideas on how we could help each other. Um, and I go to these conferences and I'd be so inspired by the generation of leadership uh, that I saw across the country at, at every different level of government. And then I come back home and uh, it was 2018. Uh, people were angry and frustrated and had a very correct sense that uh, the Trump administration and national government was not meeting their needs and in fact was working to actively make their lives worse. Uh, and I thought it would be really helpful for people to get to see and hear what I saw at New Deal conferences, which was that you have this um, really energetic group of people from all different backgrounds who could have been working uh, in virtually any profession in the world, could be making a lot more money, uh, could be living in big cities, could be living very different lives, yet they chose public service um, and they were doing, they were solving problems in really creative and new ways. They were not uh, engaging in sort of traditional, it's a, we either need a big government program or no government program. They were thinking about how to best deliver results. Uh, and I wanted to bring those voices to more people with the idea that, uh, one, it might restore some people's faith in government, and two, it might inspire some person who is sitting at a desk, maybe feeling a little uh, unempowered or feeling like they couldn't make a difference to, to sign up for the planning commission, to run for the school board, run for a city council seat, run for the state legislature, because while hopefully all the the leaders we've had on are inspiring. Uh, I think they all come across as very accessible, normal people who are struggling with raising kids or, you know, didn't have a clear direction on where they wanted to go, came to public service a little bit later in life, came to public service really early in life and learned a lot of lessons. Um, and so that was the real goal was to sort of replicate what you were creating uh, at these national conferences and really expand it to a bigger audience. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to when we can be back in person together to exchange ideas. And, um, but, but I agree that this has just been a really great way to introduce, uh, those thoughtful leaders and redefine for some people what public service means. And for people who aren't familiar with the reference and an honorable profession, tell them what that, what that comes from. Yeah. So, um, so it's a quote from my political hero, Bobby Kennedy, uh, who talked in a law school speech about how politics is an honorable profession. And I thought, you know, I, it was so, uh, it's, it's practically revolutionary in this day and age to talk about, uh, being an elective office as being either honorable or a profession. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was worth sort of framing it up that, um, there's a long tradition in this country of treating people who choose to serve and do it well, uh, as both honorable and professionals and that we needed to, and that I had, you know, we have 50 examples so far and we'll have hopefully 50 more really soon uh, so that people can know that, that it is a good way to, to spend your life or at least a part of your life trying to serve your community. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And, and you have had uh, so many amazing guests on the show already in these first 50 episodes. Um, I was looking back and just remembering, you know, some of the great leaders you've talked to, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, when he was back as a little known mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and not and an active New Dealer, um, not a 
presidential rock star candidate. <laughs> uh, Stephen Reed, the first African-American mayor of Montgomery, Alabama. Washington State Lieutenant Governor Cyrus Habib, right after he announced that he'd be leaving politics to enter the priesthood. Um, Nevada, Danielle Monroe Moreno, former corrections officer and police officer who went on to champion criminal justice reform in her legislature. So, you know, and I love all of these people, so I could just keep naming them and not stop. But I, but I know um, they impress you as much as they impress me. In fact, I, I didn't go back and count how many times, but I know for a fact that you have said more than once that one of your guests will be the ne- you know future president of the United States. <laughs> so so yeah. more than I mean, once you've said and that. I- <laughs> Absolutely, and 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 I've and the crazy thing is, like I've meant it every time. There's been <laughs> some um, some folks like Elizabeth Brown in Columbus, Ohio, or Garland Gilchrist, who's the lieutenant governor of Michigan, where they're talking and they're so smart and personable uh, and engaged and doing it for all the right reasons that you're like, you know, this is this is somebody who's going to be. Uh, you know, it's going to be a, a president or a national leader and we're getting to share them with the, with our listeners first, right? Like, I think it's, um, I think, I think we're doing an incredible service to highlight these folks. And then for our listeners to say like, yeah, when people talk about, uh, Adrian Fontes in Maricopa County, uh, or Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin, um, you know, in two or three or four years, uh, you're going to have heard them back when they were just beginning to engage when they're trying to, to maneuver through state or local politics. And, um, and I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be invaluable for people to hear, you know, sort of what they were like before, uh, before they become, you know, truly national political figures like Pete, uh, who will, I'm almost, uh, ready to forgive for not announcing his presidential run on our on this podcast. Um, uh, I think I tried. We should talk but, to him about uh, the next one. Yeah, let's get him to he, do that. Uh, he's he saved it for a little bit bigger platform, but um, but you know that's an example of somebody that we both of us have known for a long time. Knew he was brilliant. Knew he was creative, uh, and knew that if you sort of got him in front of a national audience, his his approach to public service would completely resonate and, and, uh, and we were right. Yeah, that's right. And then there are, I mean, one of the, you know, most rewarding things about New Deal generally in this podcast in particular is that uh, working with these um, amazing leaders who are so dedicated to public service and just the inspiration that they give me every day and doing my job is to find these um, really thoughtful results oriented, impactful leaders in their communities um, and, and, and to that point, you know, I've loved hearing, um, in, in all of your episodes as you've been talking to people about why they chose to go into politics. You talked about the fact they didn't have to, right? It's not easy to, to have a job where you live your life so publicly, where inevitably you make people unhappy because you have to make decisions. Um, and, and particularly now, as you mentioned, when you serve at a time where people just think so poorly of, of politics and politicians. So I'm curious, kind of what were some of the themes you heard from the the leaders you interviewed about why they chose to to go into public service? Well, I, the, the thing I'm most happy about is that as I think back over the 50 episodes is that there is no uh, single answer, right? There is no single path. I think Mandela Barnes talked about how he was a little bit lost and ended up running for office and getting killed. Uh, but sort of stuck with it, built relationships, went back and worked with people. And in doing so, um, really, uh, ended up, um, you know, as a national political figure, uh, you had, uh, Garland Gilchrist, who I was just talking about, who, you know, is a programmer, uh, at Microsoft, uh, in Seattle, making good money and leading a very happy life but felt like he needed to get back to his hometown in Detroit and try to engage and use some of his technical skills and his passion for politics and change uh, in order to, in order to improve the community he grew up in. Um, And, you know, and then everything in between Danielle um, Monroe Moreno is one of my favorite guests we've had. Uh, I didn't know a lot about her going in, but when she's talking about her past as a correctional officer and um, how she uses that experience 
in order to craft good policies to prevent people from ending up in the justice system. Uh, I just thought it was so incredibly powerful. And that's, that's the thing I like is that each person's story is unique. And because, because I think we're getting people before they get to the national stage where they have to start watching everything they say, I think people are really honest about, um, you know, their, the doubts they had about themselves or the, the questions they had about whether they were meant for this life. And, um, I think it's really valuable to com- to give people an honest assessment of what it's like to, to run for office in America today. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, you, you've talked to people from, um, I think it's worth pointing out too, uh, New Deal leaders and people you've interviewed are, uh, ac- you know, from across the country. They're from, you know, rural areas, cities, they're from coal country, the deep south, purple, red, blue states. So, you know, were there similarities um, or differences that you heard as you talked to people from different parts of the country? I mean, I thought I, I, that's the thing that, uh, you know, I think I, I live in Santa Cruz, California. It's uh, probably one of the most liberal places in the United States. And so it is helpful when I can talk to Chris Harris, uh, who comes out of coal country and understand, you know, what his community wants. And they went overwhelmingly for Trump, but they still elect him uh, and how how he communicates with his constituency. You know, I think I think what you hear and I think what makes us New Deal leaders and hopefully is probably the reason you choose us is we all tend to be a uh, you know, oriented towards action and results. Uh, and so um, I think that there's a lot less sort of blind ideology among New Deal leaders, in part because many of the offices we hold, uh, there's not a lot of time or room for blind out ideology. We have to get results for our communities immediately. But I think that's a commonality that, that we found is that everyone's sort of like, look, if you tell me it's a good idea um, and you can show me some some data that it's a good idea and show me that it's been proved somewhere, I'm going to steal it. I'm going to adopt it. Um, you know, in my own career, Ben McAdams, who was a former New Deal leader, who's now a member of Congress, uh, he was the mayor of Salt Lake County. Uh, he had this amazing program called uh, Nurse Family Partnership, where he brought public health nurses in from the moment a low-income uh, first-time mom found out she was pregnant for weekly visits till the child's second birthday. It changes the whole trajectory of that child's life, changes the trajectory of the mom's life, and you know reduces costs and benefits the community over time. Uh, you know, sitting to Ben and talking to him at a conference. Uh, I was absolutely convinced. I came back to Santa Cruz. We put together the money. uh, And last year, we just graduated our first class of uh, two-year-olds. And sitting there and knowing that their lives are dramatically better. uh, They have a 70% less likelihood of ending up in the juvenile justice system. Their literacy uh, will be a grade higher. Uh, They had less visits to the emergency room. Their moms will earn more money uh, over their lifetime. Uh, and that all came because I sat in, uh, next to Ben McAdams one day over lunch and he was telling me about this great program that he was excited about. Well, I absolutely love that. And I love, um, you know, the, uh, just the impact that, that those kinds of conversations have in spreading and good ideas, you know, and we, and we didn't make this point, um, Explicitly, so so I want to do it. Um, you know, New Deal and the, the people you're interviewing, um, for the most part, when they're New Deal leaders, when they're New Deal leaders, they're always state or local elected officials, right? Um, they are not uh, uh, federal officials. And in fact, was, I was getting ready to prepare for this talking to you today. I was uh, I went back and watched your TED Talk, uh, TEDx Talk that you did earlier this year, um, and which everyone should Google if they haven't and watch it because it's fantastic. And it's called Local Government, Where Democracy Goes to Live. Um, and in that talk, you say there's never been a better time to be in elective office if you want to address the challenges. Um, and you focused on the outsized impact that local and state leaders have compared to, to th- what's been able to be done in Washington. So uh, you mentioned a few of these things, but, you know, just you want to say a few more words about kind of what what you're seeing from the people you're talking to about the impact that they're able to have in their communities. Yeah. I, and I'd say like that's the ironic an undertold story of our time is that because of the colossal failures in Washington, D.C. to address climate change or racial equity, housing, 
immigration. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. It's left room for local governments primarily and st- state governments as well uh, to jump in and address these issues in really new and creative ways. And so uh, you have uh, cities that are coming up with ways to to deal with the opioid crisis. We've all had to figure out creative ways to address the pandemic and keep, you know, try to keep our support, our local businesses and protect our local workforces. Uh, There's, you have this wide room because, you know, there's relatively little that we can agree on as a country um, right now, but at the local level, people trust your local leaders. We have to get results. And um, each one of these programs can have a real impact. And then the cool part is when you come up with a good idea, uh, Tashara Jones, who's a treasurer of St. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, came up with a college savings account. Tobias Reed, who's the treasurer of the state of Oregon, took that idea and adopted it statewide. I took that idea and adopted it countywide. Um, so you can actually, if you come up with a good idea and then you take it to these networks, like the New Deal, you can actually make national policy or state level policy pretty quickly. So you can have a national impact while, you know, being at home at night with your kids uh, and not spending all day, uh, you know, dealing with impossible and difficult situations. Yeah. Sorry, Debbie. (laughs) That's okay. And you know, the other thing New Deal is we are, we are kid, pet friendly. (laughs) You know, you mentioned, um, you know, we're talking so much about the, the, you know, the seriousness and the impact and the, you know, the inspiration. Um, it's also fun. Uh, you know, when you talk about accessible, it's fun to hear that, you know, that people that you talk to are, uh, you know, have quirks or have, you know, funny stories or whatever it is. So I, I thought I'd love to ask if you have a couple, um, you know, just moments, uh, memories of talking to people that just either surprised you or you just thought were funny that you'd want to point out. You know, I um, yeah, I think that I think that's a good question. I mean, that's the other part is that um, these folks, given the nature of their jobs and their need to connect with people, are also just so much fun to talk to because uh, they because they do need to have a sense of humor and they do need to be humble and personal. Um, I mean, I think when I think back, you know, uh, Leary and Gaylor Baird, who I've known forever, who's now the mayor of uh, Lincoln, Nebraska you know, talking about how she gets people to deal with her hard to say name. Um, <laughs> I love you know, that. Pete Buttigieg had the same, uh, same challenge. Um, you know, and I think uh, Mandela Barnes talking about a little bit about, you know, getting blown out in a race when he first decided to run and being a little bit lost. Uh, you know, I think, I think that each one of those moments is incredibly valuable because it does, uh, one, I hope it's entertaining, but two, it does remind people of how, um, you know, that this is that people are going to make mistakes. They're going to um, try and fail, and uh, and that's also part of the experience uh, Absol- of serving absolutely. or trying to serve. Absolutely, and I'm going to add one of my own favorite um, favorite memories is. Uh, Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller giving us all a lesson on uh, heavy metal music, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, and how he, yeah, how he approaches problems through the lens of Metallica. Um, yeah. that, was a, that was a good moment. Yeah, was, That's a that good honorable amazing. profession moment. <laughs> I love it. Well, let me end, um, Ryan, with this question, which is a little bit back to our, our serious uh, where we find ourselves these days. We're 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 talking uh, on Friday, September twenty fifth, which is thirty nine days until election day. And we're, uh, you know, you, you talked a lot about it throughout the, our conversation, but, you know, we're just in har- a hard moment and in a dark moment in our history with um, with COVID, 200,000 Americans dead, with the economic crisis, the, the wildfires and other uh, weather events. Um, and, you know, frankly, a concerted effort by our president to divide us on issues like race and 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 very worrisomely to, to undermine our election and our democratic institutions. So with that backdrop, um, sometimes it can be hard to have hope. And I just wanted to, you know, again, let you, you know, what's this, what is this podcast? I know what it's meant to me. What is this podcast meant to you in terms of finding a little bit of that hope and optimism for the future? Yeah, I mean, I think um, every episode uh, renews my hope. Um, you know, you have Tim Keller, who's figure out a way to use uh, stimulus dollars to protect local businesses uh, during the pandemic. 
uh, and uh, you see the quality of people that are coming up um, and their commitment to service and doing it for all the right reasons. You know, you can get lost in all the bad stories of the day, and certainly we need to be paying attention to those to to the efforts to disenfranchise people or or divide us uh, to punish uh, underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I think those are all extremely real, but it's also real that you have people who are trying to solve these problems and making, you know, progress, uh, at every level, uh, and leaving their communities a better place. And I, I, with every episode, I'm, I, I leave, uh, with more confidence, maybe not in our national government, but in these governments across the country where people are, uh, are, are doing really remarkable things that I know, you know, those of us who are also in local office will happily steal, replicate, uh, and, uh, and expand. And so we'll get to a climate strategy, uh, one community at a time. We'll get to reform policing one community at a time. Um, and in doing so, I think, you end up actually with a stronger set of reforms than if you try to do one big reform at the national level. Let the laboratories of democracy try it out. Uh, let people learn and share and improve and iterate. Uh, and when you do that, uh, we'll end up with a lot more lasting and meaningful change for the people uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, well, here, here to that for sure. Uh, Ryan Coonerty, I want to just thank you. You're such an inspiration and as a leader in your own right. And um, thank you for, for conceiving this fantastic podcast. Thanks for letting me share some of the hosting duties uh, and, and for, you know, just being a partner uh, in our combined effort to try to elevate the voices of leaders who are making a difference and to c- continue to give the country uh, and all people hope for the future. So thanks so much for being our, our guest on the other side of the microphone today. Well, thanks, Debbie. And I, you know, think about if knock on wood, things go well, uh, where we'll be at our 100th podcast, both for uh, the New Deal, our podcast, but more importantly, for our country. Uh, I'm excited about that prospect. Me too. Me too. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. <laughs>